how did you feel about being selected for the platform section, but also being acknowledged in a way uh, where where you went up against Martin Eden was you know in the uh, at Venice and in competition. So yeah. in uh, well, yeah, it was yeah an honor to be selected um, by Cameron and Andrea. So just if, knowing it was their decision too meant a lot too because I've admired the programming over the years. And yeah, and then just not only, yeah their confidence in the film. Um, because yeah, sometimes people get distracted by the budget or, or certain elements like that and sort of dismiss it, or even just dismissing Canadian films. That mm-hmm. a bit of, can be a bit of a problem. Mm-hmm. Some filmmakers are hesitant to premiere in Toronto and would rather premiere, you know, Locarno or or Berlin because there's that fear of the uh, being ignored, I guess. Yeah. So, but yeah, their confidence in placing it there. And then when we heard the selection, yeah, I'm, a, I'm already a fan of so many of the filmmakers in the program. So Pietro Mochello's Lights to Futures are incredible. Um, Federico Verroge, yeah, this is uh, an amazing lineup. So. Mm-hmm. How did budget constraints not hinder but enhance your creativity? Sure, yeah. No, that's a lot of uh, my process, and it's been a process that's been evolving for over a decade now with the same collaborators. Mm-hmm. But yeah, a lot of things that are you know initial um, prac- practical limitations become um, assets or benefits. Uh, so we always did not have a lot of money, we'd always have to schedule around people's jobs and whatnot, but that forced us to shoot over a longer period of time and to have, you know, people the luxury of being able to shoot something and then cut it and then shoot again. So we shot this film over the course of two years, Wow! which is a huge commitment, <laughs> but at the same time a huge luxury um, to have that space to let something grow. So yeah, it's, it becomes kind of abstract in different ways of you know, money, but in a lot of ways I think we had certain advantages that other um, filmmakers didn't just that we're all friends we've known each other for so long so many things that are priceless that I think enrich uh, the film how does time away from a project Mm -hmm. inform or better enhance um, how she might think about the character or or how she might act on the next sure Uh, I mean uh, probably Derek can answer it better than me Um, but yeah she she has asked that from time to time because it's sort of unusual um, but I would say her answer is probably some of mine that it allows for sort of a unique perspective mm-hmm. to sort of live with a character for a while. Um, but yeah, a lot of I think what this film is is sort of unknowable sort of things about people and sort of um, a portrait of someone but a fragmented portrait and seeing you know these juxtapositions in different moments. So sometimes a bit of time away um, makes it uh, a little less contrived and a little less linear and um, allows for. Yeah, a whole mixture of, you know, the character having euphoria and then agony and anxiety and, um, yeah, but I think as unusual as it is to have it for, for two years, I think, again, it um, yeah, re- allows those moments to be very full in mm-hmm. a different way and just approach, because we also just shoot one scene at a time mm-hmm. and can really just get the full sort of... Uh, that visceral charge yeah. and that weight... Um, when you watch a film like this, you're, you're thinking about how it's being crafted, perhaps, in the post-production stage. Um, the editing, I think, was very key in order to, yeah. to enhance the, that sort of like, uh, from the get-go, we're in, we're in a very uh, confusing space. <laughs> and so I was thinking, did some of the, the editing ideas come in post, or is oh, this yeah, some... Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, and there's a much longer version of the film, there's a much shorter version of the film. Mm-hmm. So yeah, we definitely debated and cut and make, move scenes around and really, I really trust my editor. Um, yeah, I always cut all of my films um, all the way back to 2007. Um, yeah, she's, she's incredible. And um, yeah, it really is a collaboration. I really hand the footage off to her and value, again, her perspective. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, the opening sequence in particular, those uh, sort of non-linear intercutting between the two was something found in the edit. Okay. I think, you know, I know that came from watching and screening the film and just wanting to break the film free from um, certain tropes, I suppose, or certain sort of pitfalls of how, how the screenplay was working and sort of limiting um, us. But yeah, trying to sort of inject a bit more confusion uh, to disorient the audience and sort of encounter and for the first time more we wanted uh, them to. I was wondering if you could uh, discuss the title. Constantly evolving. Sometimes there's a title right at the beginning and it's the metaphor or whatever throughout the project. This one wasn't the case. Um, and again, it's maybe from what we learned through editing it, but just the um, 
skydiving as a metaphor. Mm -hmm. um, we wanted to have uh, her name in the film too. It felt appropriate before it wasn't her name. Um, yeah, I like uh, I like that it's uh, something about it is kind of clinical or a measurement as well too, and drawing attention to the act mm -hmm. of jumping. Um, but uh, yeah, it really just uh, you know it. Uh, it just worked when we when we when we were testing it out, um, but yeah, the skydiving as a metaphor, or again, <laughs> it's a mixture of things too. In some ways, yeah, it's you know another good uh, you know the title that sometimes I think of, or maybe someone mentioned was uh, the Herzog title. You met ecstasy of the woodcarver Steiner. He's a woodcarver, and then he goes ski jumping, and it's sort of the, the counterpoint uh, to his existence. But yeah, I mean that's in there a bit. I mean it's her metaphor, but at the same time it's. It's kind of trite sometimes the way she talks about skydiving. So it's, it's, so it's, it's it, sometimes it is the film's metaphor, sometimes it's Anne's metaphor, and it's also just the timeline, I think, to contain it. You know, mm -hmm. this period of time that we're with her, which I also like, from the tandem jump to the solo jump, while there's all these other sort of uh, she's on the brink of something else happening as well too, or in a sort of depressive or manic phase. And that that whole cycle. I'm uh, I'm relating this to the last feature that I the, the last work that you saw, uh, that I saw of yours, which is Scaffold, yeah. and you tend to almost posit your your protagonist in like a different POV where where there's like a certain like um, high shots, low shots, yeah. interactions happening between characters, and um, I, I was wondering what the first kernel of an idea that you had for this film was it to have a female protagonist was it to get into the um, sort of that mindset of the character what, what's the first idea that you had that, that sort of like gave you the I'm impetus totally honest, yeah, the first kernel was, was Dara that I wanted to work with Dara I wrote it for Dara so when she moved to Toronto that was like I now I know who's going to be in my next film okay. um, and then I guess other epiphanies or small moments uh, the daycare that's featured in the film yeah uh, it's in real life is run by my mother and um, for 40 years she ran it she's in the film she plays the supervisor okay um, and it was the real it was also me visiting the daycare and I went there as a child and then seeing teachers that looked after me as adults and that sort of duality and then while at the same time realizing we could work in this environment and with children and so that's I, I sort of write for people I, I, have, I can cast or uh -huh. locations I have access to and then, but it's just all the associated memories of those places too. So it's like practical, but then also like the depth of sort of life experience and sort of memories and thought and thoughts. There's a lot of personal anecdotes in this film. Uh, <laughs> true stories or things happening or memories that sort of, so in the writing process, those are, are crucial for me to sort of highlight these sort of memories and then sort of find ways to, to what you're, so, so uh, when if you watch How Heavy This Hammer, Dara has a cameo in that film where she plays a daycare teacher. So we shot that back in 2015. Um, Matt, Matt Johnson's in it too, uh, funnily enough. Some people have asked, like, is it the same character? Okay. But it maybe is sort of a starting point. Um, we wanted to see what she looked like in the daycare and just, does this feel right? And what sort of, how do we feel about it? But then also, what is it like working together more, more practically, especially mm -hmm. with Matt? Like, mm -hmm. that was a big unknown for this film. Like, would they be able to work together or would they get along? And I know Darrow is a little, hesitant but I think their collaboration was incredible and they loved it like once we got through that um, so yeah I mean but all my films have been like that it's the first time I mean I was a little nervous working with actors because it was new to me other films the performances are more being inspired by the actual personas of these actors mm -hmm. that we find like mm -hmm. Derek or Irwin mm -hmm. and um, something to challenge my ideas so it's sort of filtering these sort of introspective angsty sort of a <laughs> Things that make me want to make a movie, filtering it through Derek, filtering it through Irwin, and realizing what's possible, what's not possible, and challenging those ideas. This was totally different working with Derek because I mean, she's a filmmaker, she's a cinephile. We have all the same references, so it's more on us. So it took. We thought, it, you know, part of me was hoping it would be faster because we would just speak the same language. It was the opposite that we had to find ways to sort of get outside of our heads and sort of ground in things and uh, just start filming and reacting to the character and letting the character make decisions almost and sort of learning from, from that and how she behaves and how she deals with certain conflicts. Um, so yeah, it was a really rewarding process um, and I yeah, hope we work with Dara again. How did, um, the way you frame her in several scenes, it's, it, it almost feels like an uh, extreme close-up, mm -hmm. some, some of those shots. Yeah. How did um, 
How did the, the, the visual template come about? How did you know that you wanted to explore that character from such a close proximity? Well, if you see my other films, it's recurring. I mean, it's how I, how I film. Mm -hmm. I, I'm, I'm writing with that in mind. And it's something that's, again, evolved. Um, yeah, you know, there's obvious limitations of that, of these sort of... And it was something that, that um, attracted me as a young filmmaker, this sort of uh, candid documentary moment, this sort of real texture, which would make me feel like I was making something, but as you, as you do that more and more, you realize the pitfalls of that, mm -hmm. and the limits of it, and almost um, the functions of that, sort of, obviously, you know, if you watch Tower or Hammer, we're so close to them, um, but couldn't really say we understand what's going on in their heads, and it's almost becomes sort of a philosophy or something of these sort of encounters and these mysteries and these sort of lurking crises in people's lives that... Does the character understand? Do we understand them? It was the, is the David Care supervisor right? Was Matt wrong? Mm -hmm. These sort of moral questions. Um, so yeah, again, it's um, I like sort of drawing, being so close to the mystery. I, I think is a nice way that sort of tension. And I also like that it's uncomfortable and it's disorienting. That I feel like we shouldn't feel we shouldn't, shouldn't be too comfortable. We shouldn't have too privileged a viewpoint. We should always be adjusting and challenged. Um, you're, you're Toronto based and, um, on your tote bag, I don't know if you could show your tote bag, yeah. but, um, so tell me a little bit about MDFF. Um, you guys have, over the years have, have gone from, I think it was single screen series yeah. and now it's like the wheels are turning. It's like somewhat pr production as well. It's like, yeah, there's always been production. That's how it started. Okay. Uh, so it's Dan Montgomery and I. Dan, like Isla, has worked on all my films. We went to film school together. He's always produced everything. Um, so it's always kind of been our sort of what we work underneath. Started out with uh, producing, so my own films, uh, Nicholas Pareda, Antoine Bourges as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and we still do that. Um, but it's shifted a bit more into distribution and um, curation. Uh, so with Tower, my, my first feature, when we were traveling around, we just saw so many films and made, met so many filmmakers that wanted to play in Toronto and there's just no room for them to do it. Like you realize, especially this was back 2012, 2013, and just the state of cinemas in Toronto, there just wasn't an easy route for it to happen. Yeah. Uh, especially just for a single night screening and for an audience to figure it out. And we just sort of kept things going with the promotion of Tower and just started looping in other filmmakers. So the first film we screened was The Unspeakable Act by Dan Salitz. Mm -hmm. And uh, we did that in Kensington Market in a tiny little our gallery, um, we didn't even own the projector. We would, we would, what we'd do is we'd go to Best Buy and Future Shop, buy it, and mm -hmm. sort of rent it for a month and then return it. 30 days, 29 yeah. days, and, just to be safe. Um, that's how we started, and then it just kept growing. And now, yeah, we're, we're working with uh, TIFF and the Cinematech there, and uh, we're able to invite filmmakers from around the world. Kudos so, to, um, the, to that, that's yeah. amazing stuff. And then, yeah, doing theatrical runs now too. So, MS Slavic 7 in October, which we're really excited about. Great. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for your time. Hey, this is Eric from MyOnCinema.com. If you want to support us, subscribe below. For more reviews, interviews, film festival coverage from Sundance, Cannes, Toronto, you want to check out these guys on this side.